Prime Minister, welcome to 7.30. Good to be back on the programme. Now, the International Monetary Fund warns that the history of government subsidies to industry is littered with failures. That's the word they use. How do you convince Australians that your government and its agencies have the discipline and the rigour to get it right? Uh, they know that there's a global competition for new jobs and new opportunities. This isn't the old protectionism. This is the new competition which is there. And unless we participate in it, uh, we will fall behind. So we've got to be in it to win it for those new jobs, new industries and new opportunities. Now, you're, you're talking about those very large subsidies that have been provided in the US, in well, particularly the US, the massive Inflation Reduction Act and the CHIPS Act, but also in Europe, in Korea, in Japan. How does a smaller economy like ours compete with these powerhouses when it comes to subsidies and investments in Australia? By making sure that we look at the comparative advantages that we have, uh, the resources that we have under the ground, the resources that we have in the sky with the best solar resources in the world. So we can effectively produce green aluminium, green steel, for example. We need to produce batteries here. Well, um, I don't want to interrupt you because we will come to some of those specifics, but I guess the question is, it's about how do we compete? There's a global competition for investment. There's a lot of money on the table in those countries I just mentioned. How does that work in Australia with a much smaller economy? We compete on the basis of the advantages that we have. And by not trying to compete on everything, this isn't competition with the IRA. We can't compete with the Inf Inflation Reduction Act. What we can do is identify where Australia has particular advantages, particularly because of our resources, because of our location in the mm. fastest growing region of the world in human history, our workforce that we have, our skills and universities working on it, uh, but making sure as well that when we have innovation and breakthroughs like we have in solar technology, we commercialise those opportunities here. All right. Is the budget going to set out the amounts of these investments, or clearly the new money available to these projects? We've already set out, of course, a range of investments. Mm -hmm. Critical minerals, uh, $4 billion. The Hydrogen Head Start Program, $2 billion. Solar Sunshot, $1 billion. Uh, the National Reconstruction Fund is a $15 billion program. Mm -hmm. So there are a range of funds that we've created and programs that have started or kick-started ones as well that we'll develop and there'll be further announcements, not just in the budget, but in the lead up to the budget and indeed beyond. This isn't something that's a one-off event. Mm. This is about Australia shaping our economy so that we can take advantage of the opportunities which But are, are we going to see new money amounts in this budget? Uh, yes, you will see new, new programs, uh, new funding and new opportunities, working with business, one of the things that we have been doing here is collaborating very closely uh, with uh, our scientists, with our researchers, with the opportunities that, which are there, but also with Australian-based businesses. The other advantage that we have here, of course, is our superannuation industry, $3 trillion of funds, looking for the opportunity to invest in businesses and opportunities that produce a long-term return, and that is what a range of these projects will do. Well, as I said, we will come to some of the sp specifics in a moment, but I want to quote a particular line from the speech today about the aims of the policy. You say, securing greater sovereignty over our resources and critical minerals. What does that mean in practical terms? Well, for example, what Canada has done is have a, a, a program of ensuring that their critical minerals say they maintain some national sovereignty or ownership over it domestically. Is that what we're going to do, something like the Canadians? Because they're going towards or have already done divestiture, haven't they? But they've got much stricter rules on investment in critical minerals. Will we do the same? They have very strict rules. But what we want to do is to make sure that we value add here rather than just export the raw materials, wait for someone else to value add, wait for someone else to create the jobs and then import it back at greater value. But just stay where we were, if you would, Prime Minister, because that's a question about whether or not you have um, uh, vertical integration is the terrible expression for that, which mm. I'm sure leaves most people cold. But staying with that idea of greater sovereignty, are you intending to introduce stri stricter rules on foreign investment, as you just mentioned, like Canada has? Uh, no, not necessarily. But you'll see some of the measures in the budget 
uh, that will come forward and in the legislation that I've foreshadowed today, the Future Made in Australia Act. But one of the things that we are looking at is areas of identifying uh, two, two different motives, if you like, for intervention. One is where Australia has a comparative advantage. The second is where our national sovereignty matters. So, for example, we've invested in the creation of mRNA vaccines here. Uh, that is because we identified during the global pandemic uh, the problem if we don't have the resilience by having our own pharmaceutical industry here. Mm -hmm. That's an example of protecting our national sovereignty. Similarly, we can't have a situation where we have uh, the best uh, per capita solar panel usage in the world, but we don't make hardly any here. Just, I keep saying we're going to come to solar panels and the detail in a minute, but I just want to stay with this sovereignty question because you used the word a few times in the speech, but this is very precise. This is about resources and critical minerals. So are we going to see new legislation, new rules around foreign investment in Australian critical minerals and resources? Uh, well, we have, of course, foreign investment mm. rules now that look at our national interests and that look at our national sovereignty. Are you looking to tighten them? We will uh, always examine on a case-by-case -case basis uh, these processes. Am, am I wrong in saying that in your previous answer to the question you did imply that there would be some tightening of those rules? Well, no, but we're prepared to, if it's not working, we will always look for national sovereignty. Uh, we welcome of course, foreign investment here in Australia. It will play an important role in this transition. Is it your thought that there's been too much foreign investment in these new critical industries? No, my thought is that there hasn't been enough investment in value adding, mm. that there's been investment in extraction, but not investment in value adding, creating jobs and increasing uh, uh, our, up, up the value chain is where we need to go, because that's how you create jobs, and that's how you also uh, protect our national sovereignty by making sure that we remain a country that makes things here. This is sort of in Labor's DNA though, isn't it? This idea that we have given too much of our resources wealth to foreign companies. Is that your view? No, my view is that uh, foreign companies have played an important role. But that, uh, I make no apologies for asserting the national interest here. And that's why uh, we need to make more things here in Australia. And one of the things that the speech was about today was asserting the position, which is just a fact, that the whole world isn't stepping back and leaving things to the market. The world in this decade has changed the economic paradigm that we're dealing with. And if we are not involved and not engaged, then the whole world will just move past us well, because they are all intervening to look after their national interests, mm. to make sure that they uh, make things in their own countries. We need to make sure as well that our economy is more resilient. All right, well, let, let's look at some of the specifics. I promised you we'd get there and here we are. Solar, for example, you've mentioned solar panels. Now, in terms of that, it, that industry, it's a mature industry. Uh, in, even in the US where they had enormous amounts of money poured into the manufacture of solar panels. It's very difficult for a manufacturer there to make a buck because the Chinese are flooding the market with a glut of so solar panels. So what job, what could the Australian government possibly do to support making solar panels here when they're being made everywhere else and even the Yanks can't sell them? Well, we've already done it. A company that is based pretty close to here, SunDrive, is looking at uh, manufacturing at the Liddell power site. They've got an agreement with AGL. They are producing solar panels that are more efficient than that produced anywhere else in the world. By just adding a couple of percentage points in the efficiency on a solar panel, you can extend the life, you can reduce the number of solar panels that you need and therefore increase productivity arising from it. Uh, we believe that this can be a very competitive exercise. Australia can compete. We've been very good at innovation over a long period of time. There's not a PV uh, solar panel anywhere in the world that mm. doesn't have Australian IP from the mm. Australian National University or UNSW. What we haven't done 
has commercialised those opportunities and we need to do so. Let's talk about batteries. It's another example that people have spoken about. What can Australia do in terms of making batteries that isn't already being done by the Chinese, by the Japanese and the South Koreans? The point is that we have the, every resource that goes into a battery. So do they we, and they're already doing it? Well, they don't all have the resources that we have, which if you look at lithium, nickel, copper, uh, we have the combination which is uh, the best in the world. Isn't that an argument for making specialised batteries rather than trying to compete in the enormous battery market, which, as I say, is dominated by those countries? Uh, of course it's a, a, uh, an argument uh, for us to not try and do everything, but to work out where we have a competitive mm. advantage. And one of the things we want to do with the various systems that we're setting up here isn't for government to say, OK, here are the winners, but to set up a mechanism so government facilitates and is a catalyst for private sector activity. We still want to use market-based mechanisms because that's the way that you get efficiency and that's the way as well the market will determine which of these new industries get the support, get the drive. But if you don't have that support in the initial period from government, then you simply won't be able to attract the investment. So in part, why we're doing this legislation is to send a signal to the market to provide that certainty and that we are a government that is prepared to back Australian industry, back Australian jobs and back making things here. And, and will the government have the discipline to leave projects to leave industries where it's not working because that historically was the problem like the car industry we stayed far too long there was not the political will to bail out at the right moment well the problem with the car industry of course was that in in leaving or being asked to leave what we lost was a whole lot of other industries as well and we lost a lot of complexity in our manufacturing sector and that had real consequences not just for the car industry itself but i was in queensland uh, last week the boxes there, uh, an advanced uh, military uh, vehicle, yeah. uh, which is being produced by a German-owned company, being made in Queensland and then exported to the tune of a deal of over a billion dollars to Germany, as well as exported to other parts of the world and indeed used by the Australian Defence Force. That's an example of where we can make things here. We make buses, we make trucks, we make a range of vehicles here. We need to make more agriculture as well. How do we value add in food, in increasing yield and productivity? How do we look at uh, biofuels to look at in the aviation sector? How do we uh, have sustainable fuels? These are all industries that will grow into the future. They're huge opportunities for us. We need to identify them, back the ones that are the best opportunities and seize the moment which is there because this decade will define whether we go forward or we, or we just stand still and watch the world go past us. Let me just go on to, uh, to another issue. Are there any circumstances, any circumstances in which Australia would move to recognise a Palestinian state before the war in Gaza is over? Well, the conflict, of course, is taking place there and what is happening is that there is a global discussion about what happens post the conflict and how we provide a long-term political solution, which is in the interests of both Israelis and Palestinians. Now that uh, comes down to a two-state solution. Uh, that is what Penny Wong uh, was talking about that, the other day. And that's night. the question, is there any, are there any uh, circumstances in which Australia would move to recognise a two-state solution ahead of an end to the war? Well, there's no proposal uh, at this point uh, in time. But what we know is uh, that uh, Australian recognition is an argument that's uh, significant. What's more significant is what is the solution in the Middle East that avoids the conflict which has been there for our entire lifetime? How do you get a resolution whereby Israelis can live mm. in Israel in peace and security with recognition by its neighbours in security knowing that uh, it's not going to be attacked and how can Palestinians achieve justice and a, a sustainable uh, living. It is, it is not acceptable that generations of Palestinians have been uh, forced to live in the conditions in which they have. That is a cause of much disruption and conflict in the Middle East and indeed that has flowed 
uh, beyond the Middle East at times as well. Would your government be prepared to move to move on that ahead of the US or will you inevitably wait for them to move first? Well, what we're doing is engaging with our partners and we have had uh, very similar comments that Australia's made uh, as the United States has done, uh, Canada has done. I've issued a range of statements with uh, the Five Eyes partners, Canada and mm. New Zealand, all of which have called for a two-state solution and indeed in the parliament we've called for a two-state solution as well and that is something that has received very broad support. Um, just on the question of Zomi Frankham, is Air Marshal Binskin on the ground and is he getting the, ac the access that you demand? Well, we will deal with that privately. Is he there yet? We'll deal with that privately and we'll release a report at an appropriate time. We want uh, Mark Binskin to be able to do the work that he's undertaking. Are you concerned that he's not going to get the cooperation you want? Uh, no, I'm, I'm confident that he will receive uh, cooperation. He's someone who is a well-respected figure uh, globally. Uh, due doesn't to, mean the idea is to going to cooperate experience. with him, though, does it? I understand that, mm. but what we what we are doing is putting forward. We've put forward someone uh, who is well qualified uh, to have a proper examination to report uh, to us, so that we can have the accountability and transparency that the Australian public expect. And if you don't get it, does Australia remain a friend of Israel? Look, Australia's friendship with Israel uh, goes back to its very foundations goes back to the work that Doc Evatt did. Uh, but friends of Israel uh, need to, like friends of, of anyone, need sometimes to tell people uncomfortable truths. And the truth is uh, that uh, people are very concerned uh, about uh, the actions and the, the consequences of what is going on in Gaza. Uh, we have uh, made very clear our opposition to a ground offensive in Rafah and it's important uh, that people who are friends are able uh, to talk straight, and that is what we have done. And just finally on Julian Assange, uh, his lawyer this afternoon after Joe Biden's, the President Biden's comments in the Rose Garden were, it's time for you to keep the pressure up. Is, is there anything else that you can do? We're continuing to engage, and I've made it very clear as Prime Minister, as I did as Labor leader before the election, that enough is enough. Uh, it is time that Julian Assange was allowed to come home. Uh, there is nothing to be gained from his further and ongoing incarceration. And we've made that very clear. These are complex issues uh, with the Department of Justice, the separation of power between the political system and the judiciary. We understand that, but we think there is a way through and we've been working on that for some time and we'll continue to do so. Prime Minister, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank, thank you. you.